And now we're just waiting for Facebook to stream us over. We are heading there right now. Facebook is 50% of the, the way there. Should we pretend to be talking, you know, like how they do on like a talk show where they're they're talking and you can't hear what they're saying, but at least they're looking lively that way. Or a musical interlude. <laughs> <laughs> and we are live. Welcome, Mighty Mystery Fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeBello, and I am thrilled to be here today with Brad Parks, author of Interference. Brad, welcome. Tell us about your book. It is great to be here, Sarah. Thank you very much. So Interference delves into quantum physics. Are you, are you ready for that, mighty mystery people? Uh, the premise is, what if you could use quantum physics to help find a missing person? So our protagonist is Bridget Bronick. She is a librarian with uh, hearing loss, which I kind of enjoy, a, a character you don't often find in a thriller, someone with hearing loss. Her husband, who is a physics professor who has been poking at the mysteries of the quantum universe, has gone missing. And she now has to harness the science he's been researching in order to find him. Ooh, well, I know I'm intrigued and I don't know squat about quantum physics, but I'm already in um, for all of that. So I can't wait to read it and to hear more. And I love that you featured a character with hearing loss because you're right, we don't see a lot of that on the page. And I think it's important that we start to see a lot of, you know, everybody on the page. Everyone deserves to see them on the page, on the screen, on the stage. And so thank you for bringing that um, to your pages. Before we get into this, I have to share just a few words of your incredible praise, which you have earned so and by the way i just want to welcome everybody from facebook welcome 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 um so if you have any questions you guys know how this works if you're new here here's how it works if you have any questions for brad just type them right in the comments i'll get them right over to him and he will answer you live we're a community we love writers this is your chance to talk to brad pick his brain ask him anything about quantum physics his book his writing practice we love to chat about this stuff. So just while you're thinking of it, I'm gonna share a few words of his phrase. I'll be monitoring all those questions right over here on my second screen because I'm fancy that way. I mean, while you're thinking of them, again, let me delve right in. Publishers Weekly giving this a starred review, raving readers will fully engage with the well-drawn characters as Parks convincingly reveals the science that buttresses the suspenseful plot. Wow, congratulations on a starred review from Publishers Weekly. Also, you gotta love that it include the word buttress. You don't see that every day. Uh, I'll take Kirk it, is, sure. <laughs> Kirk is raving a twisty tale. Parks' suspenseful novel will beguile in trance and fool the sharpest reader. Wow, amazing. And you know, Kirkus doesn't give that easy. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> medium saying the mix of science and heart pounding thrills will have you on the edge of your seat. Robert Dagoni, who's coming on the show, I believe next week, raving a smart, innovative thriller that evokes the best of Michael Crichton and Blake Crouch. Parks proposes the seemingly improbable, makes it plausible, then weaves in twists and turns, taking the reader on a mind bending ride. Holy crap, this is amazing. Brad, tell us, how do you write a book that gets this kind of praise? Well, so actually, I, I should probably quit now, Sarah. I, I feel like I'm ahead at this point. And anything yeah. I'm going to say is just going to take a straight downhill from that. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's it's obviously gratifying. I, I think as a lot of your uh, viewers, listeners and whatnot know, man, you, you spend a lot of time and a, a lot of emotional energy. And you pour it into this book the whole time thinking, will anyone like it? Will anyone like it? I mean, you know, besides people to whom I am married to or related by blood. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, when you get that kind of response uh, from, from people you really admire and respect, I mean, Bob Dagoni is one of the best in the business. Uh, you know, it's just, it's really gratifying. Um, as to how you write it, um, a lot of self-loathing, uh, a, a lot of uh, desperation and uh, a few, no, let me see, probably about 50 to 90 uh, four mile runs during which I think of everything. But that's Ooh. about how you do it. Yeah, I'm a runner. I, so I, I like, I really, uh, I've come to, uh, like, it, it, it's, you know, where do we get our ideas? So don't we always get asked that awful question? Um, and I always say, I, I get, 10 ideas for a book a week, 11 of which are bad. Um, but for me, like my ideas come to me 
while I'm running. Uh, like there's just something about like, you know, your body is moving and it's kind of like using enough of your subconscious brain, but it's really just this thing you kind of know how to do. And in the meantime, the subconscious just, you know, that's when it kicks stuff at you. So whenever I get caught in the plot, I go for a run and most of the time about a mile or two in, I figure it out. My wow. thighs are like rocks. <laughs> exactly. And it's so interesting because actually my neighbor teaches creativity at Harvard. And she said mm. that actually the studies show that most people's great ideas come to them in the shower while right. driving or doing some sort of physical exercise like yoga or running or whatever, have yeah. whatever, whatever you like. And it's for the exactly the re same reason that you said, and that she actually showed, said, which is that, um, why Einstein had all his best ideas while working at a filing while working as a filing clerk in the patent office because filing is Brainless. so boring it engages yeah. the lower brain so then your higher yeah. brain could be like thinking of, yeah. of clever plot ideas clearly that's working for you but again yeah. let's get right into the craft of it so sure. um Kirk is saying a twisty tale Parks's suspenseful novel will beguile and trance and fool the sharpest readers how do you actually set out to beguile and trance and fool even the sharpest readers because it's a delicate dance right you right. don't want to make it so obscure that people are like what the f just happened at the same time right. you don't want them to figure it out on page two how do you how do you right. do that brad well you know to be honest this is some this is my my 10th novel and for some of my early novels i made it a little too hard too easy to figure out actually because i was that guy you know whether i was you know reading a book or watching a movie or whatever like i was always the last person to figure it out you know i'd be <laughs> like what? what the butler did it i what Are you kidding I, I never saw that coming my mind is blown you know and so i was writing books like this and you know especially when you first start out and the, you know there's this hardcore mystery community reader and you know and these are people who read 240 books a year right and you are just not going to fool them and you know because i went to things like BoucherCon and thriller fest and whatnot I was meeting a lot of these readers who were kind of like, you know, patting me on the head going, that's nice little boy. But, you know, I knew on page 50 what was going on and they did. And so I think from that point on, I really had to dedicate myself to to making it harder to figure out. Uh, I have a saying that readers love to be wrong. And yeah, you know, I think that's just one of the most gratifying things about reading. And so I kind of look to make them wrong at any opportunity. And I think because I don't look, I will get to this later, I'm sure. I'm a pantser, not a plotter. Um, and so the rule always is like, if I'm surprising myself as I go along, I'm probably surprising the reader. So, you know, my goal as I'm writing, you know, especially that first draft is like, just keep surprising yourself, keep surprising yourself. And most importantly, don't be bored, right? If, if I'm writing and I'm suddenly bored, like something is wrong and I need to go back to the drawing board to make things interesting because if I'm bored, the reader's gonna be bored. So how do you go back to the drawing board and make it more interesting? <laughs> Again, I, I go for a run and, <laughs> and then, um, you and know, I think oftentimes, yeah, there's, a, you know, sometimes you're rereading, you know, oftentimes the, the answer is somewhere in the character themselves. Uh, and I'm, mm. I'm sort of fascinated by how often, uh, look, now we're gonna get into the like the goofy woo woo part of the program. That's um, what we're here for. I, I really do believe the characters talk to you, right? Mm -hmm. And you you have to be willing to listen to them and to kind of let them be in charge a little bit, which can be, you know, especially the more controlling you are as a person, that can be hard. Um, but I'm amazed how often that when I'm I'm working on a scene and it's just not coming together, it's not working, what the hell is going on? And I'm beating myself up and hating myself and all these things we do when our writing isn't good. And I finally figure out it's because I'm making a character do something they don't want to do or that they don't naturally do that, you know, and I think it, it's so important to know your characters to like to be able to close your eyes and kind of see them to be able to hear their voices to kind of know their stories and know how they'd react. And so you're, you're kind of constantly asking them, well, what would you do in this situation? Mm. What would you do? And it, it, it's the diving deeper into that. It's like, okay, I know Sarah as a character. I know her so well, even though we're just meeting online for the first time, just for everybody's <laughs> reference. But like, you know, so I, I just said like, what would Sarah do in this situation? And oftentimes if you dive deep in, enough into that, you'll find some pretty surprising answers. And that's where you take the book. Wow. Okay. And so when you ask your characters, you know, what would, what would you do? And you mm. try to stay open to them. 
do, does you ever hear just silence? Is, is anyone ever <laughs> yeah, just those... is anyone ever giving you the silent treatment? Just like mm -hmm. yeah, no, th those are the bad days, right? Those are the tough <laughs> days. And I, but I really do like I, yeah, like I, I will wander around. So um, you you may have seen in my bio that well, at least up until COVID hit, I do most of my writing at a Hardee's restaurant. Um, you're up in Boston, so you don't know what a Hardee's is. But if you no, live... I know what a Hardee's is. Okay, like if you live yeah. anywhere in the southeastern part of America, you would know Hardee's. Yes, right? um, a big and orange it's... writing. Yeah, it's strangely not a place you'll find a lot of people writing novels. I know, shocking, no. but um, <laughs> there have been times where I will actually I'll get up from the chair, and if I'm having problems, and I'll kind of like walk around the parking lot talking to myself and like actually talking as the characters, right? And that's because like, if I can hear them talk and they can talk through things, sometimes I can kind of like drag them. If they're, if they're being all standoffish and silent, I can, I can like drag them into talking. The one thing I should warn people about is if you're going to do that at a Hardee's, make sure you're really good friends with the staff uh, as yeah. I am, because you know, this is a Hardee's I've been writing at for a number of years so that, um, You'll you'll get what happened to me, which is one day I'm you know wandering around the parking lot muttering to myself and and just you know I write first thing in the morning. I usually haven't showered. I'm you know I'm always kind of a little rough looking, everything like that. So I'm wandering around the parking lot talking to myself, which mystery writers will recognize as perfectly normal behavior. The Virginia State Police do not. Uh, yeah. So the state trooper like pulls into the parking lot and and like goes up to the drive thru and says, uh, "Ma'am." Uh, you have a deranged man in your parking lot. You, you want me to pick him up for you? Uh, and thank God all of the, the, the workers there know me. So she just said, uh, no, that's okay. He's just our author. <laughs> I love it. I love it because I, I'm, I'm guessing not that many people are at Hardee's as early as you are walking right. around the parking yeah. lot talking to themselves. Yeah. It's a good thing you made friends with the staff. I hope you, I'm sure you tip well. And and they're gonna protect you so that so that you don't get hauled in for being a crazy yeah. <laughs> for, for well, being the guy. You know, they're they're kind of my coworkers too. And look, I, I like right. I, I kind of make fun of Hardy's sometimes and everything like that. But like, do you know what time a Hardy's biscuit maker gets to the restaurant every morning? I, I do not. I'm guessing it's real early. Four a.m. because they Ooh. need to start making the biscuits. And I'm always yeah. like, I'm often there, you know, pretty early myself. And I always take inspiration from the biscuit maker because you know something, Sarah, you never hear the biscuit maker say, I don't feel inspired to make the biscuits today. I don't right. feel like making the biscuit. No, they shut up and make the biscuits, <laughs> right? And I think there's a lesson in there for us writers. Like, don't treat yourself like you're so damn precious. Make the effing biscuits, okay? <laughs> Okay, I think that's gonna have to be our pull quote from this. Make the effing biscuits. Make the effing biscuits. We'll put it on t-shirts, <laughs> everything like that. Yeah. Make the effing biscuits. Brad Brad Park's <laughs> mighty mystery interview. <laughs> I love it. But it's so it's so true because I think as a creative person, it's it is hard. It is it's a struggle. It's hard yeah. to know if you're any good. It, uh, you know, you're often filled with self-doubt, yeah. if not self-loathing. So this is you know this is it's so true and 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 just getting back to that just effing do it make the biscuits is such a good yeah. reminder i i absolutely love this and it's so true um so thank you for this this is fantastic yeah. so uh, yeah I'm, I'm a big believer and by the way if you think you suck it probably means you're doing something right um you know i i frankly think that and having been around you know i've been around this community now for a decade and the only people who truly suck are generally the ones who think they're great right? It's, it's, it's the ones who doubt. It's the ones who have that self-loathing. They're always the ones who are, who are the best writers, you know? Like, you, you won't find someone more tortured than, say, Megan Abbott. She's convinced she's horrible. Or, uh, like, Harlan We just Coben. had her on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Harlan Coben, who's, you know, how many books has he sold? How many wars has he won? Like, who could have a better career than that? Convinced all the time he's terrible. And, like, you could just go through, like, most of the really great writers who we esteem, all at some point or another think they're terrible. So the trick you have to pull, and this is like, okay, fooling your readers is one thing, you gotta fool yourself. You know, like you, you really, and I believe this very, very strongly. You have to wake up every day and feel like I am telling the right story. I am the right person to be telling that story and I'm telling it in the right way. And sometimes that means lying to yourself, but unless you really have that confidence, I don't think you can move forward. So even 10 books in, 
give yeah. us hope oh. for the, for those of us who have not yet. I'm still in book two, um, okay. and and many in our audience are you know are are still working right. on writing that that first book. If, and some and some people just love to read, so welcome to those people as well. But so even ten books in, you still yeah. struggle with us. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I think it's gotten worse because now I know more. <laughs> so I, I really know how much I suck. Right. Um, but you know, like I'm even still, uh, you know, I was trying to count the other day, the number of books I've thrown away, either like entire books or pieces of book. And like, well, was that 0.4 of a book or 0.6 of a book? And how do I <laughs> add that to the total and whatnot? But like, it's between four and five whole novels that I've thrown away since I got published. We're not talking wow. about this stuff before I got published, like since I've been published. So like, yeah, you're supposed to struggle. Like it's, you know, and mind you, some of that is, is the product of my uh, meandering haphazard approach to things, right? Like I get myself into stories where I, I get in trouble, I can't get out or, or something's kind of fundamentally broken and I don't figure out until about halfway through. And it's, it's a hazard of what I do, but you know, it's, it's, constantly, constantly difficult. Again, if, if it's not hard, you're doing something wrong. And how do you know whether it's one of those things where, where it's one of the ones that is, uh, you know, right. that needs to be abandoned versus one of the ones where you just need to go for a run and right, right. shake it off? How do you know? Well, some, sometimes you know early, like actually before I was writing Interference here, I'm going to, yep, there you go. Um, Point to it. The, the book that was originally going to be Interference was going to be this book about uh, like big data and artificial intelligence. Like I was kind of like fascinated by some of the ideas of it and like, and specifically, could you find a serial killer lurking in data, right? Um, and there are actually people trying to do this in real life. And I thought, what a cool book. And so I did like a month and a half of research on, on AI and big data and all this other kind of stuff. And actually like, I have a database of 40,000 murders that have been committed in the United States, or maybe it was more than 40,000. It was some absurd number of murders in this database, right? So I got deep in, and then I started writing the book, and about 5,000 words in, I realized, oh crap, I'm writing a book about a young woman being chased by a serial killer. And nothing wrong with that book. I like reading that book. I don't want to write that book. I just don't, mm. you know? And so like, you kind of go, God, if, if I don't want to write it, ain't no one going to want to read it. So that was like, that was one I could throw away or um, a book and a half before that. Uh, there was a book where I was kind of getting this like niggling, awful feeling. Like, um, I think it, it, it might be too hard to figure out who the bad guy is. So uh, I, I have the greatest agent in the world because she is a mind-bendingly fast reader. Her name is Alice Martell. She's fantastic. If you're looking for an agent, query her. And uh, so I sent it off to Alice, about 60,000 words or so. She calls me like a day later because she's Alice. She's insane. And the first <laughs> thing she says when she gets on the phone is, so I think I know who the bad guy is. You know, and that's like one of those things where it was kind of like, it was so broken. I, had, I just had to throw it away. Um, you know, you're not going to make omelets without breaking a few eggs in this business. Um, Absolutely. But then, and then sometimes it works. Let's talk about your database of 40,000 killers. It might Did be more than, it might be like 200 because it was actually, I think it was, it was 40 years worth of murders. And there are something like 10,000, 15,000 murders a year in this country. So it was actually, it was much bigger number. Oh, but yeah, like I, uh, now that's some fun. So shocker, Sarah, I'm kind of a nerd, right? So as I'm going through this database, yes, me too. you know, like I'm doing stuff like, you know, sorting by this or that. And like, yeah. oh, some of the, some of the stats I came up with that, you know, I'm, I'm throwing out now because like, what am I going to do with these stats? But I, I, it was something like, um, women are like 4.8 more time, more times likely to be killed by their husbands than husbands are to be killed by their wives. You know, like yeah. really cheery stuff like that. That makes yeah, me go. We're, we're you know, peaceful people. Yeah. Girls pick up your game. Okay. <laughs> like let's, let's get going here. <laughs> Also makes me want to write a book about a woman who kills her husband, but that's another that's another subject entirely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh my gosh, absolutely. So, did you hand assemble this list, or you bought it, or you accessed it, or no? It's it's out there, man. There's all sorts of stuff out there on the on the web. Yeah, I, I downloaded it. Oh my god, fantastic! And are, are you going to keep going back to this to <laughs> for yeah, to, right, to, for, to for mine ideas material? And yeah, no. I see. You know, it's funny. I don't know about you, Sarah. Like, I don't like to go back for things. 
Like I like once I've discarded an idea, like people will often ask like, oh, so, you know, are you going to try and like massage that book into shit? Like, no, never. Like I'm, I'm always like what's in the rear view mirror doesn't interest me. You know, like I'm always like what's ahead. What's because I think I still fundamentally believe, uh, you know, despite my receding hairline, like I'm relatively young, like I'm 46, you know, and, and one of the great things about our business, I think, is that I, I think an author doesn't really hit their stride until like their 50s, their 60s, you know, yes. and, and we see, uh, you know, some really terrific authors who stay sharp. Oh, well, I mean, my God, Mary Higgins Clark was writing bestsellers and she was like 90, you know, so like, and, and, and an incredibly sharp, bright, vivacious woman. And, you know, so you, like, there's a, there's a long life cycle here, right? And I yeah. feel like I'm still on the way up. I'm still trying to get better. I'm still working on my craft. And so I always know what, what is going to be out there ahead of me is going to be better than what's in the past. I love that. How are you working on your craft? Just through the practice of doing it? Or are there specific yeah. things you do? Well, I think, you know, it, the, the key is like to, I don't know, to, to be concentrating on a few things at a time. And, and maybe I couldn't even unpack what exactly I'm specifically working on at, at a given moment. But I, cause I think with each book it changes and I, I'm actually just about to be starting a new book. So I'll let you know, but you know, it, it can be things like, uh, you know, maybe certain aspects of character development or pacing, mm -hmm. or, you know, where mm -hmm. you're, you feel like, you know what, that's just something. I, okay. So an example from earlier in the show, God, I need to make it harder to figure out who the bad guy is. Right. Yeah. Like, and that was a, that was a multiple book work to get okay. up to, where Kirkus says you'll be astonished and fooled, you know, like and that was a, well, but see, but it's something you're mindful of, you know. And I think when when people look at you know the the whole growth mindset thing, if you're into education, um, one of the things that makes a growth mindset really successful is when you are aware of what it is I'm trying to grow at, what it is I'm working on. So like knowing your weaknesses, and may, maybe it's dialogue. You know, and like dialogue always came fairly naturally to me because I was a newspaper reporter. You know, I quoted people all the time. I had that. But for some people, dialogue is like hell, right? Yeah. Well, so walk around with a notebook and start writing down stuff you hear, right? Mm. And be and, and and really tune yourself into conversations and listen to how people actually talk. And, and but mm. make that your focus, right? Like make that the thing that you're super excited about doing. And you're saying to yourself. I don't know what's going to go right or what's going to go wrong in this manuscript, but damn it, my dialogue is going to be sterling. Exactly. Oh my gosh, I love that. I love that, and I think you're so. I think you're so right. So now that you can't write at Hardy's to, due to the pandemic, <laughs> and you're writing at home, are are you getting up at four a.m. to make the biscuits to make the effing biscuits, or what are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to make <laughs> effing biscuits. Um, <laughs> They, uh, you know, two things that have been bought a, a lot more in my home lately are um, alcohol and earplugs. Yeah, um, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, yeah, obviously, you know, I, I, I saw some, some tweet early on during the pandemic by someone who, it must be an alien or something like that, like saying, I'm so much more productive now. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> what? You know, like, yeah. I, I think, you know, the, the key during the pandemic for me has actually been the opposite. And that is yes. low bar, you know, like be, be a little more forgiving. This is a hard time. It's a stressful time. Yeah. You know, I don't care how good you have it. And like, as authors, we have it pretty good. Right. Yeah. But it's still, you know, our families and the world around us. And it, it, it's, it's going to be harder. So like, I am normally a thousand words a day guy, like no exceptions, no excuses. You write a thousand words a day or you're a worthless schmuck. Uh, oh no, seriously, that's how I treat myself. And um, I've kind of come to realize, that, you know what? Maybe maybe 500 is okay now and then. Like, you know, allowing yeah. yourself some bad days because, you know, the world's on fire around you, you know, literally. Yeah. Um, yes. So, yes, in California. Yeah, so the pandemic, it's, it's not been great. And I don't want to, I don't want to lie to people and be like, yes, I've soldiered on as if nothing is happening because that would be, well, garbage. Yeah, exactly. And I think we need more of that transparency, especially on social yeah. media, where it's always the highlight reel and you can really start to feel bad. I also right. have really struggled during the pandemic yeah. um, with concentration, with creativity, with yeah. motivation, um, because it the world is on fire metaphorically and literally if you're in California. 
Um, and it's a scary time and it's a stressful yeah. time. And we have to be acknowledging the truth of that and, and acknowledging that it does have an impact on us as humans. Right. And especially now that we're, you know, a good six months in, yeah. um, we're all, I read a great article about, you know, we're all in surge depletion. You know, at first it was like, okay, mm. I've got to get through this, but now it's like, okay, I'm, I'm exhausted. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. I think that's so important to hear messages of truth and authenticity, like you just delivered to be kind to yourself and to acknowledge that it is having an impact on your on your life on your writing and that that's okay because we're all here together um yeah. and and so thank you for that for that vulnerability and that honesty i think that's that's really appreciated pre appreciated um and my <clears throat> excuse me, my partner in crime, pun intended, uh, Margaret Pinard, also an author, is handling things for me over on Facebook. And she's reminding me, thank you, Margaret, that also in Oregon and Washington, there's also yeah. fires. So thank you. Oh, it's okay. not just California. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, um, and yeah, also I Colorado. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and Colorado. And um, yeah. so I want to, I also want to acknowledge Margaret's great work. Um, she does an amazing job doing, I, she, you'll see when you go back, Brad, but she does all of these amazing pull quotes of pearls of wisdom that you're dropping and sharing with our audience. Including... Um, so she's, Make the She's effing amazing. biscuits. I hope. Make the effing I, biscuits. I hope make be, the effing biscuits becomes a bold quote. Make the effing biscuits is going to become a movement. Um, <laughs> so we have. So yes, um, so yes, and she's also pointing out that it is time for our Q and A. So yeah, if anyone like, has any questions, God, or, <laughs> no, we're, no, she's saying pedal to the metal more. Um, she's she's saying this is fantastic. Um, she's she's saying it's getting to Q and A time. The, she says, the dialogue be popping. Yeah, it is. Thanks to Brad, um, and thank you, Margaret, for saying that. So anyone have any questions for Brad about his brand new book, Interference, about his writing process, about his Hardy's obsession, his biscuit his biscuit making um we're here for it so while you are just drop them right in the comments and i will get them right over to brad um and i know it always takes me a minute to think of it so while um while we're waiting i'm gonna keep asking you um a couple a couple more questions how long did it take you to write interference uh the first time the time i rewrote it once the time i rewrote it twice or the you know like it we want to hear so, the whole process. Yeah. So generally, uh, it, it's really different with every book. Um, and somehow I kind of managed to stay on a book of your schedule. I don't know how. I think, you know, sometimes it goes pretty smoothly and I'm able to get ahead of schedule. And then other times it's, you know, it, it, I, men should be really careful making references about book writing a book being like childbirth. But, you know, yeah. it is sometimes <laughs> a very difficult delivery. So, you know, typically uh, like a first draft takes me between three and four months, right? Because, hey, a thousand words a day, do the math. It doesn't take that long. Um, but then it's a question of like how much rewriting and editing and whatnot are you going to have to do. Uh, with this book in particular, that wonderful agent I told you about before, Alice Martel, actually she's horrible. Do you want to know how horrible she is? On It was Christmas Eve uh, 2018 or 2017. I don't know. The, the years run together, right? Um, yeah. It was Christmas Eve. I remember that much. She <laughs> called me up and she said, hey, you know, uh, this book, it had a different title at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what did you think, Alice? She says, you need to rewrite it. On, she's like, Merry Christmas. Ow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I've been look, looking forward to, like, taking a couple of weeks off, you know, eating cookies with my family, getting fat, yeah. all this kind of stuff. And instead of like, mm -hmm. oh, God, the day after Christmas, I got to start working again, right? Um, <laughs> So, uh, so you know, a, a lump of coal in your stomach. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, I mean, this one really took the better part of a year by the time I was done, you know, writing, rewriting, editing, everything like that. Um, okay. Yeah, so it took that. you a year. How long did it take you to get the first draft or, or to get it to Alice? But yeah. That's, infamous about, Alice. that's about three months, three, three to four months, somewhere in there. Okay, uh, so you drafted difficult. it. Do you revise it before you send it to the now infamous? Okay, right, yeah. So you, you want the whole thing. So basically, we want I the do. Whole thing, the all right. Dirty. So I do. Uh, I do a draft that is, you know, well, it's going to be rough to a certain extent. Um, not on a sentence to sentence basis, because mind you, I used to be a journalist, right? So we only got one draft when we wrote, right? Um, but then uh, I kind of get to the end. I do one edit on my own. I call it the elephants dangling from the ceiling edit. <laughs> which is, you know, I go through and make sure I didn't leave any elephants dangling from the ceiling, like that everything is kind of lined up. Because I, I try to edit as I go, don't get me wrong. Like if I realize that like character A, who I thought was going to be, you know, an anthropologist and instead is going to end up being a plumber, 
like I will actually go through and change, you know, all of those references and make it, you know, she, uh, you know, not she has dirt under her hands from the field work, but she has dirt <laughs> under her hands from the the pipe she just fixed, like whatever, yeah. um, you know, and kind of like go through it. But, but even still at the end, there's going to be stuff you missed. So I do that. Um, and then I do send it to beta readers. Um, you know, like family, friends, people who kind of, you know, know me and whatnot. Uh, and I kind of get like a, a, a general sense of what they're feeling about things. Uh, my rule there is if I hear a piece of feedback once, I kind of bounce it off my own internal editor, see how I feel about it. Because people can have weird opinions, right? Even loved ones and people close to you. But if I hear <laughs> they can be twice, They can be stupid and not know they can be Well, no, not my beta readers. My beta readers are all <laughs> smart, right? But if I hear the same thing twice, I make the change no matter what, right? Um, so I, it's kind of a semi-edited version that gets to Alice. Alice is then my first professional read. Um, how, wait, how many beta readers, readers do you have? Say again? How many friends and family beta readers do you uh, have? Probably like five beta readers, six, okay. kind of depending on, you know, who's busy. <laughs> sometimes yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm swamped right now. Sorry. Like, all right, fine. Um, and then, uh, you know, and sometimes actually depending on, yeah, sometimes I have author friends read it and I won't say who because I don't want them to be inundated with requests to read manuscripts. But, you know, you kind of get that reciprocal thing going on of like, all right, I'll read yeah. this for you. You read this for me. We're all good. Um, but then, yeah, so after Alice, I, I give it a really kind of thorough edit. Uh, and then it's off to my editor. Um, and then, you know, that process can be as easy or as not easy as you can imagine. Um, so like the book I have coming out next has like, so if interference was a, a pretty difficult delivery, the book I have coming out next, not as bad. I only had to do one rewrite on this one. Uh, but from that time, from then onward, it's been smooth sailing. You know? <laughs> so um, I, I'm with Amazon Publishing now. They actually have a thing where not only do you have your editor, you actually also have a developmental editor who mm -hmm. is an outside person that they hire uh, to give like totally fresh eyes, which is actually, it's been wonderful because, you know, your editor, like, look, you've pitched them the book. They've been hearing about it all along. They're going to be, you know, sometimes as good as they may be, they have a, a tough time stepping back versus the mm -hmm. developmental editor comes in fresh. has never heard a pitch, has never, you know, no expectations. Um, and, you know, her, her name is Charlotte Hersher, who I've been working with, and she's wonderful. Uh, and she is for hire as a freelance editor, if anybody is interested. She's fantastic. Um, but I think the other fun thing about her is we are not, um, like, we're both contractors at Amazon, right? So she's not my editor. And it, mm. it simplifies the relationship because, you know, your relationship with your editor has layers, you know, because sometimes they're going to be your editor. Sometimes they're going to be your cheerleader. Sometimes you're on the opposite sides of a negotiation table. You know, there's a lot going on there versus with mm. Charlotte, she has one goal, make the book better. Yeah. And God, I got to love that. Um, so that's, that's that. the whole shooting match right there. I love that. And did you, do you always take, so when you're sifting the feedback from your betas, um, what about when you get to Charlotte? Is it just, you take all of her advice or have you ever disagreed? I'm trying to think if Charlotte would be watching this right now. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We do have, we have a good number of people watching. I don't listen to a word that woman says. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, there's, there's always going to be back and forth. Um, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's, what is interesting, again, coming from a newspaper background, in the newspaper world, what appears under your byline truly might not be something you wanted to be in there or like. Like, you don't get ultimate say. I, I think with the books, there's, there's just more of a sensitivity of, you know what, it's ultimately, pff, that's my name on that book. And so yeah. it's got to be something that I like and I'm happy with. Um, and so there's some back and forth. But, you know, I think... All, and, most of the time, yeah, I just do what Charlotte says. What the hell? She's a smart reader. I'd be dumb <laughs> to listen to her, right? Um, but now and then, you know, if, if I'm if I'm going to push back and really believe in something, then she'll back off, you know. So it's always that that give and take. I love that. I love that. Um, tell us about. Do you have a weird writing ritual besides going to Hardee's and walking around the parking lot talking to yourself as a disheveled, you disheveled sure. vagrant? Um, what do you do? You have any other weird that you'd like to share? Oh, I'm like, I, I got weird coming out my ears, Sarah. Like I'm, I'm weird everywhere. Like I am. We're, we're here for it. We're, I'm, I'm such in. an incredible creature of habit. So let's, let's take a Hardy's day because yeah. that's, that's kind of the normal. Now these days it's just been so, so batty and crazy and everything like that. Like I have exactly the same breakfast every single day. I, it's, it's two sausages and, and an apple as I drive to Hardy's. I wear exactly the same. I have this little like zip up. Sorry, you guys can't see me zipping. Zip up writing jacket. 
and I wear my my, my zip up writing jacket. It kind of because like it gets a little cold in the corner at Hardee's, right? Like yeah. so, I, I I go there and I you know I sit in the corner, I start working. The first thing I drink is a Coke Zero, right? Okay, I was expecting you to drink in it, Hardee's so it, coffee. No, no, no. I'm not a coffee drinker. No. I'm, I'm a total okay. diet soda guy. So I, I drink a Coke Zero, but then I start to get a little cold. So I bring a teapot with me and some tea bags. Oh, you know, yeah. Okay. And they let you the, do that at Hardee's? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because again, I'm there all the time. And so the yeah. people behind the counter are nice enough. They'll fill it with hot water for me, like the really jet hot water from like you yeah, know, the, yeah. the special hot That's, water thing. Yeah. So then I have two cups of tea. Mind you, it has to be herbal tea because I don't want extra caffeine because I'm already getting caffeine from the Coke Zero. But then at a certain point after two cups of tea, I'm like warmed up again, but then I need caffeine. So yeah. I go back to the Coke Zero. And like, and so it's kind of like this flowing back and forth between herbal tea and Coke Zero until somehow I have a thousand words done. And by that point, I've had enough caffeine. I'm shaking like an 80s hairband drummer <laughs> and, um, and I'm peeing about every 20 minutes or so. But the urination, the urination is really important because that's when the dialogue inevitably comes to me, right? Like you get up to go to the bathroom and you're still in your book and you're still thinking about it. And like, and then that, like that little bit of dialogue just kind of snaps in your head. Like, oh, thank you, urinal. I appreciate it. And then you're on your way. Is that I, enough I, weirdness I, for you? Like, do you want no, more idiosyncrasy? It, I can keep going. Yeah, but. <laughs> we can keep going. So remember, Mighty Mystery people, you heard it here first. Brad Parks gets his best dialogue in the urinal at Hardy's. Yes. Remember, you heard it, it here. Now, but, yeah, keep going with the weird. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, but don't you. don't expect to get the same kind of inspiration because that's my urinal, okay? Okay, okay. Hands off. Don't, Hands off. Don't you be stealing my urinal, Sarah. <laughs> oh, I, I'll, I'll, only if I'm wearing a rubber glove. Um, <laughs> What, how many Coke Zeros a day do you drink? So I try to cut myself off at three. Oh, like the, oh my like God, the, I thought you were going to say 18. No, the but they're the big, going. hold on, you can't see, like they're the big cups. They're like the large, like these are like trash okay, cans. Okay, 20 ounce, of, okay. Yeah, oh, they, there might be, they're probably more like 32. I don't know, they're, I, like I try not to think about that. It, it is, it's, okay. like, it's a lot. Um, and, I, and I definitely do try to cut myself off. You know, caffeine stays in your system for about like six hours or so. So yeah. after about two o'clock in the afternoon, like I'm done. I got it because I got to start winding down or else I'll never be able to sleep. Okay. Okay. So how long are you at, at Hardy's? Is, is it till you get to a thousand words, you don't care if it takes you 12 hours or two hours after a thousand, yeah. after a thousand words, you get to go home or you stay from like six to 12 when the yeah, biscuit so it can leaves. be, it can be the thousand words and I'm done. Like if it's a really okay. difficult day, like that's my reward. Like, man, and I, I'll like okay. hit a thousand mid sentence and be like, and I'm gone, you know? <laughs> um, but, um, but most days it's like, it's a little more than a thousand or if I'm rolling, it's like, hey, 14, 16, 1800, that's a good day. You know, it's really, I stay until the words stop making sense. Yeah. Um, and uh, like, cause I'm, I'm really, oh, so first of all, I, I need to preach about one thing. Tell us. Do not write with the internet on, right? You cannot write with the internet on, at least not the way I do it. So like my phone, my phone does not have my email on it. Um, it also like, I have to go through this weird fancy hack just to get to a, um, a browser on my phone. Like I just seriously don't have a browser on my phone. Mm. Uh, I, and I make sure that the, the, the wireless internet is off on my computer, all that kind of stuff. Like that is a key, key thing to kind of keeping that high level of concentration. Um, and that's like something, there are no rules as a writer, right? But I think one rule is you can't write with your email on. You just can't. Like, and your Facebook and your Twitter and all that other crap, leave it off. Anyhow, so it typically um, about four hours, you know, so like okay. yeah, I'll typically get there around six o'clock and, you know, it would, what inevitably will happen is I'll, I'll be sitting there kind of like really working hard. And then suddenly there'll be this one paragraph that I just, I can't make it work. And I'm like banging my head against the screen. Like, what the heck is wrong with me? And I'll look up and I'll be like, oh, it's 10, 15. <laughs> I've been here. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's going on. And then the next morning when I sit down, that paragraph is like done, you know? So like, wow. I definitely know, like, yeah, that's about how long I last. But so the beauty of this is part of my reward is, you know, I get my thousand words done, then I'm done for the day. Like, and that's a big part of the way I coax myself through. Like I'm, I'm a big believer in like, you have to reward yourself as a writer yeah. for being a good little boy or girl. Right. And so my <laughs> reward is like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to spend you know, the next call, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to screw around, I'm going to like waste all the time I didn't waste while I was writing. So it's like, really, in some ways, um, I, you know, I, I think of it as like, I'm going to spend 
four really good hours of the day. Like th th those, are, th those have gotta be my best hours. That's where I'm really making my money, right? And the other 20 hours are about making those four hours as productive as possible. Um, and yeah, that's like good sleep. Um, I actually try to eat well. I think that matters. Um, when, yeah. I'm, when I'm in a drafting yeah. phase, I kind of yeah, lay off the After the sausages booth. and the apple. <laughs> well, the, the sausages, they're like turkey sausages. They're like healthy oh, okay. sausages. Okay, you know, okay. without preservatives yeah. and stuff like that and the, yeah. and the apple. Yeah. So, but, but no carbs notice like oh, the carbs okay, will weigh okay. you down. Yeah. I did not you, know that. <laughs> yes. You can have carbs for lunch, just not, <laughs> not for breakfast because you know, carbs, carbs weigh you down, but you know, okay. it, yeah. Now we, I just have one quick question and then we'll get to this question from the audience. Um, what time do you go to bed if you get up at, at four with the biscuit maker and get to parties <laughs> by six? Yeah, um, you know, my wife and I will be looking at each other going like, all right, what what time is it? Is it like midnight? And we'll be like 8.45, wow. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I, you know, I mean, but definitely by, you know, 9.30 for sure, 10 o'clock, like that's about okay. it. Um, okay. And I pretty much, I so it's a, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse. I wake up every morning without an alarm clock, right? I'm just, yeah. I'm a morning person, I'm ready to go. Like I can, and it's generally, you know, about yeah, 5.45, something like that. 5.30 yeah. sometimes, 6.15 sometimes if I'm really slothful, um, but like I'll just be there in bed and I'll be like, you know, my heart starts going and it's like, oh Christ, here we go. You know, like I've got no choice. So um, yeah. again, when, you, when you're writing by six o'clock, the day's done by 10. Wow. Good. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You heard it here. He's a morning person. Um, what about genre expectations? Mm. I was just talking with a friend about the balance between inner monologue or exposition and dialogue for a thriller and how either type can be amazing, but what does the reader expect? And what does Brad write? Tell us what Brad writes. I can't even, I can't even follow that question. It was too, okay, it was let's too go high. Through, let's go through one at a time. What about genre expectations? Okay, so genre expectations. Okay, let's start there. Uh, are start incredibly there. important. Um, and let's let's be really clear about that. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm getting I'm, I'm learning that lesson anew as if I didn't know it already with with interference because uh, most of the nasty two star reviews I have gotten are from science fiction fans who think that because there's quantum physics in this, I'm going to be taking them to Alpha Centauri. Like. <laughs> Ultimately, it's a thriller that happens to have science in it, not science fiction. But that's yeah. like a very, so like, they're killing me. Like, they're slaying me. Like, this isn't science fiction. It's like, I never said it was. But you, <laughs> nobody's going to hear that. Like, if they think in yeah. their head, it's science fiction. So like, yeah, it's, I, I think it's really important to like, and this is whether we're talking romance or women's fiction or, you know, like, know thy genre expect, expectations and follow them. And, and mind you, like, broadly applied, right? Uh, you know, so like uh, nobody, you can't say that like a mystery needs to have a happy ending. No, <laughs> but it, it needs to have a satisfying ending, right? Ooh, and there's the difference. Yeah. Like readers have to know who did it and they yeah. have to know that either the bad guy is getting punished or not getting punished or like, you know, there there yeah. need to like, the, if, if the whole thing with the mystery is you're you're asking a question very early on and not answering it until the very end, they still yeah. need to know what the answer to the question is. Um, so yes, yeah, know thy genre expectations, love thy genre expectations. Oh, so on right. point. I love that. I love that. Okay, next part of the question. Um, I was just talking with a friend about the balance between inner monologue or exposition and dialogue for a thriller and how either type can be amazing, but what does the reader expect? Is it the inner monologue or exposition um, and dialogue for a thriller? And what do you write? So what, how, do you, how do you balance between inner monologue or an exposition um, in terms of, and, and dialogue? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm writing this down. That's why my eyes are cast down. I didn't want anybody to think I was suddenly staring I thought you at the were, floor. I thought you were praying for-, for <laughs> I'm praying for an answer to this question that actually makes sense. Um, I really think, and I'm going to dodge the question slightly, but it comes down to like, what's the, what's the voice of character, right? Like okay. how, how, like, or, or what, you know, in what way am I telling this story? And so, you know, obviously if it's first person, you're going to have a lot more inner monologue you know, because that's just natural with it versus if it is that third person, it, you know, it could be more expository, um, you know, and dialogue, uh, you know, I, I would always say proceed with incredible caution. You know, there is, there is a few 
hallmarks of really bad sloppy fat writing that like when people are exchanging bits of backstory through dialogue because like people don't talk that okay. way you know it's like like sarah if you and i were married and i i you know and suddenly we're over the breakfast table and i'll be <laughs> like well sarah you remember when you used to live in the Boston area and you know, like, no, no, like you just, you gotta, you gotta deal with that differently. So, but I, I think that like, you, you need to have that storyteller's voice somewhere in your head. And, and that's often easier with the first person, right? Because, hey, it's the, the guy telling the story, the girl telling the story, whatever. Um, in, in third person, it, it can be harder, but it still has to be there. Like, I think you, like, I honestly am a big believer in Human beings love to be told stories as if they're sitting by a campfire, right? There, yeah, there's something yeah. kind of deep in our wiring about that. And so yes. imagine either your first person or your third person being read aloud over a campfire. And if it works, mm. you're onto something good. And if it doesn't work, then it's time to try something different. Okay, perfect. So I just want to make sure I understand you correctly, because I think this is a really good question. And it may have come from Margaret, um, who's, again, a, an author of several books herself. So you're saying that the answer as to as to how much dialogue, how much exposition um, is is you is a decision for you. Uh, sorry, inner the balance between inner monologue, dialogue, and exposition is for you determined by the character yeah. and what and, would be true and authentic for that person, and right. as well as whether you're doing first person or third person. So if it was first person, it might be appropriate for me, Sarah, to say, oh, right. you know, remember when I lived in Boston. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, or there was this time I lived in Boston and blah, and blah, I blah, was blah. Free, totally fine. freezing, freezing my tuchus off. Yes. <laughs> that, whereas that would not, that would create awkward dialogue. So you go, so you go piece by piece and, and, um, and Margaret saying, as you know, Larry, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> um, so, right. is, so you do change it up then. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, and ultimately like, I don't know, <clears throat> this sounds really dumb, but make sure it reads interesting. Mm -hmm. like, don't don't be boring okay don't be boring you know like don't tell yourself that like well but i need to have this exposition in there because it, like nope if it's boring pff, cut it out figure out like a different way for the reader to get the information like whatever um mm. and i yeah i don't i don't know if that helps you know a lot of this stuff it's like and this is where i'm, I'm horrible to help like it's kind of by feel Right. Mm -hmm. And you develop mm -hmm. that feel over and like this is the the whole thing of like I'm I'm a huge believer in 10 years or a million words, you know, roughly give or take. And that's <laughs> a lot of what you're developing that mm -hmm. time and over those words is just a good feel for what works for you. So oftentimes if you're if you're struggling with that inner monologue versus exposition versus dialogue, you know, yeah, maybe it's just, you know, look at where you are on the development curve and say, all right, this is this is obviously something I'm going to be working on for a while. Um, and eventually mm. it'll start to feel more natural, hopefully. Unless it's Margaret, feels natural. Margaret is, saying, Margaret is saying, don't be boring. Make the effing visit good. <laughs> um, yeah, Brad, this is so helpful. I feel like we're getting a master class here. We're getting a master class with Brad Parks um, because you're dropping pearls of wisdom and, and it's so, tr everything you're saying is so true. And so, uh, and, and, it, and you can feel that. You can feel the truth of that and the wisdom of that. And, and it is, you know, it is learned and honed and, and, and thank you for that. Um, yeah, that, I mean, this resonates, right? I think you can all feel that. Do you read your books out loud to yourself to get, to, to get that campfire feeling? I was actually doing that this morning. Uh, cause I mm -hmm. was, I was in like the end stages of this book that I'm my 2021 novel that I'm actually was just sending back to my developmental letter to wonderful Charlotte Hersher. And Yay. I was, I was seriously there were, there were a few sections that like, yeah, I was reading out loud all the time. Mm. You, you know, another reason, so not only does that help like with the ear, you know, it helps a lot with like characters who maybe you're having them say something they wouldn't say. Mm. And I think you can hear that when you read it out loud. Um, mm. You do kind of catch some like word repetitions or even, you know, just <laughs> some, some like, I, I use the word, uh, you know, come and dumb and like I'm rhyming without meaning to <laughs> you know like whatever um and uh you know the other thing is these days the largest growth market in our industry is audiobooks so oh. if it doesn't sound good those people are not gonna like it so yeah, no, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a huge huge believer as a matter of fact my um <clears throat> my second novel um Eyes of the Innocent is the name of it uh we had just had 
a uh, a little girl in, into our life. Uh, that little girl Yay. is obviously a lot older now. And during the day, she only took naps strapped to my chest in a baby Bjorn, right? Okay. Um, and so I I actually dedicated <laughs> that second book to her, and the mm -hmm. dedication said something like. Uh, you know, this book is dedicated to my baby daughter. So I would strap her to the chest in the baby Bjorn. She would, you know, take a nap and I would, I would put the computer on top of a high thing and I would be editing it. And, but I would, I would read it out loud because I always read it out loud. So I said, you know, she was the first person to ever hear this book read aloud, put her to sleep every time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I mean, I think the other thing too, is when you are editing it several, you know, many, many, many times, yeah, if you, yeah. you know, once you've worked on it from your beta readers and then with Alice and then yeah. with uh, Charlotte and then your, you know, actual editor, does it ever get boring? And it's not that there's a problem. It's just that you've read it 75,000 times. Right. Yeah. You can, you can get a little, uh, a little brain dead, a, a little tone deaf and suddenly, you know, yeah, just reading it. Big, big exactly. fan. That was a good question. Thank you. Um, Oh my gosh. Well, I feel like we've been chatting for five seconds, but it turns out we've actually been chatting for quite a while. So I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I honor your time because I know it's your pub day. You got places to go and, and, and perhaps other, you know, uh, so that was actually less, pub, had less pub day was a week ago. Um, <laughs> oh my like, gosh. I've, I've lost track I'm, of time. See, I'm already like, nobody cares about me anymore. I'm a week after publication. Like I'm bored. I got all kinds of time. Was oh my God. Yeah, you know what it is. I don't even know what day of the week it is. I can't. I'm not sure how it's September. I don't know how, right. where this year went. I mean, this is it's it's. I, I've got pandemic brain and pandemic time. Um, so yeah, I don't know yeah, where this year has went, except it's been 21, 2020 for about fourteen years now. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it really has. This has been the longest, <laughs> the longest year of of our lives. Absolutely. Um, I, let's get straight into our lightning round questions. Fred, are you ready? Hold it. <laughs> okay. Yes, let's do it. Okay. What are you currently reading? Uh, hang on a sec. I forget the title. This is the problem of, ah, uh, here we go. Ah, uh, yes, here we go. Sorry. I had a, uh, Fate of a Flapper by my friend Ooh. Susanna Hawkins. Yay. Um, so, I really, I loved it. Like I'm a thriller author, but I do kind of read widely, especially within the mystery genre. And so like, I just love, like, this is just a great historical, um, you know, and I just love being taken to a completely different time period. So thank you, Susie. Enjoying the book. Yay. Awesome. Well, who is one writer dead or alive that you would kill to meet? Oh, that's a good one. You know, I, I, I gotta say Harper Lee. Right. Like, wouldn't we? Because because she wrote one of the greatest books of all time, probably my favorite book, To Kill a Mockingbird, and then never really talked about it and yeah. spent the rest of her long life more or less in hiding. And I would just love to have dinner with Harper Lee and just oh, pick that marvelous brain of hers. And, enter and entertain her with your show tunes. You could lure <laughs> sure, her. Hey. For Harper Lee, anything, right? Exactly. You might do exactly for Harper Lee. You you, you develop a dance routine that goes with the song. <laughs> <laughs> what's one book? So I was, my next question is, what's one book that changed your life? But it sounds like it was To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, it's it's a wonderful book, sure. sure. Mm. So or actually, is there a book that changed my life though. Let's go all the way back to uh, when I was a kid. Um, I had an ear infection oh. one summer. Like I got swimmer's ear. And I was oh, like mm -hmm. a 10 year old kid who all I ever wanted to do was be in the pool. And, and I got this, this swimmer's ear. So I couldn't be in the pool for two weeks during August, like uh. worst time to be banned from the <laughs> pool. Right. So my mother took me to the library and I picked up this book called Gentle Ben by Walt Morey. And I read it and read it and read I like, I, I, I like, I wore that book out. I was so Aww. captivated by that book. And that was really the book that launched me into a love of learning that turned into a love of writing that has turned into my life's work. So wow. Gentle Ben, Walt Morey. Gentle Ben, Walt Morey. Okay. I haven't heard that one before. I love that. I love that. What's your favorite movie? Oh, you're going to find out what a sap I am. <laughs> the notebook. Love actually. <laughs> Love Actually, I love I Love Actually. I cry every time. I've watched it a billion times. I cry at the end every single time. Me I too. I love that movie. I love it. I love that movie. It's so good. It's so good. What's one thing you want people to know about you? Uh, like, God, I'm so boring. Why would they want to know anything about me? 
Um, you know, honestly, how grateful I am to do oh. what I do. Like I, I am, I am really incredibly aware of, you know, how many people are are trying to write books, how many books there are out there. And to be able to make a living doing this is just one of the most extraordinary gifts. And I, I guess I'm just, I know that like people have so much to do with their time and they have so many ways they can spend their lives. And when, when they decide to read me, it's, it's, it's really actually not about like the money they spend on the book. It's about the time they spend. Yeah. The like, that's the most important thing. Like, so that they're willing to give me six to eight hours of their life and not mm. just that, like, cause they're like, reading is like this incredibly active experience, right? Because they mm. are, they're actually creating the story in their head that they would be that invested in my story and give me that much of themselves. I'm just constantly amazed by that and forever grateful. Oh, I love that answer, Brad. I love that. I love that. That's so, and then, yes, the humility of that and the authenticity of that just resonates. It's so, I love that. Um, would you rather have dinner with Bram Stoker or Anne Rice? Oh, and rice. Like, that's not even close. Come on. So now I'm cheating a little bit because like, I, I've sort of met Anne Rice just a touch. Uh, you know, she was the, uh, the the thriller master at Thriller Fest a few years back. Uh, and so like, and that, uh, and her son, Chris Rice, who I've, I've hung out with, I've done some events with is absolutely delightful. So I just think the whole Rice family line is good with me. Good to know. Road trip with Mary Shelley or Shirley Jackson? Oh, Shirley Jackson. Great question. But yeah, I just, I, I would love to like, so I'm blanking right now, but like, I feel like every time you see like some really awesome quote about mysteries, inevitably Shirley Jackson, like <laughs> she's just remarkable. So, oh yeah. And we, we'd get into real trouble. Absolutely. And we'd have a freaking blast. Shirley Jackson, oh, I, every time. I, I, I selflessly volunteer to be in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather right, be... we're, we're driving fast, Sarah. I just want you to know. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Because you probably had three Coke Zeros by that time. You've got to make it to the next <laughs> urinal. So Would you rather be stuck in Area 54 with H.P. Lovecraft or Stephen King? So I feel like... Stephen King is fairly accessible. I kind of know how his brain works. I've read okay. his book on writing, which by the way, has one of the great forewords of all time. I, I believe it's the second forward where he says, most books about writing are, excuse my language, are full of shit. Uh, <laughs> and therefore this will be a short book because I figured the shorter book, the less bullshit, right? So like, I, and I loved his book and everything like that, but I'm going to go H.P. Lovecraft just because I feel like I don't know him as well. And uh, that'd be an exciting adventure. Okay, cool. What's one thing that you wish I had asked during this time together? Uh, I don't know. We've, <laughs> we've had such like, a well, good I time. Yeah, I, I, you know, you yeah. You sliced and diced me every, seven I, weeks till I, Sunday. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 you know, you've, you've asked everything I could ever possibly hope for. So yeah, you could, I mean, like, okay, give, give me the, um, uh, God, because I'm fumbling. Like here we are at the end of the interview, and I'm finally fumbling an answer. I can't end this. So ask me what character in fiction I wish I could be. Ooh, okay. What character in fiction do you wish you could be? Charlotte from Charlotte's Web. Really? Because all she has to do is write some little tiny sentence fragment, like <laughs> some pig, and people come from miles around to admire it, to, 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 to be in awe of it. And like, that is the kind of low bar I feel like I can consistently <laughs> overcome as a writer. Uh, oh my gosh. Well, Brad Parks, you have been a delight. This has been a truly enlightening, illuminating, educational, and hilarious interview. I want to thank you for your time, for your sure. sharing, and for your amazing energy. We have I loved having you. I want to thank, again, my partner in crime, author, Margaret Pinard, for handling things over at Facebook. Margaret, you rock. Um, Brad, thank you so much. And we will, um, I'd love to have you back for your next book. This has been fantastic. And we will see you next time on A Mighty Mystery. Cool. Sounds good. Sarah, Margaret, thanks very much. Thank you.